Good morning and welcome to the uh, Wednesday morning uh, devotional and uh, prayer time here at Faith Presbyterian Church. Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to start with the book of Revelation. And, um, you know, I've, I've never uh, done a devotional study on the book of Revelation. I've always uh, taught it either in a Sunday school class. I never actually preached through it, but I taught it uh, in a Sunday school class. I've taught it uh, in, in small group Bible studies before, um, but I've never... Uh, sat down and and, uh, and and done and done it devotionally, just just myself and and the word and you know just kind of as a quick reminder, you know, um, uh, the, these Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning devotion devotions that, that I've been recording, uh, the I basically sit down and and do my my morning devotion, pray, uh, read, and then I come to the computer and and I record, um, and so what you're getting is basically the byproduct. Of the Word of God working uh, fresh on, on my own heart and on, on my own mind, and and I, I just want to kind of break bring you along uh, on the journey as we walk through uh, books of the Bible together, like the Book of Revelation. Now, of course, when when I when I teach on it in, in the Sunday school or in a small group Bible study, um, of course it's going to have a devotional effect on me. Of course, it's going to work its way. The Word of God uh, in the Book of Revelation is going to work its way into my heart. In fact, I should not get into the pulpit. I shouldn't sit down and teach um, unless God's word has worked itself into my heart. And, uh, and, and what you hear from my teaching or from my sermons uh, is, a, uh, is, is a byproduct of that or a working out what God has worked in, in, into my own heart and, and into my own mind. Um, and so as we walk through the book of Revelation, we're going to do this devotionally. We're, we're going to uh, take God's word and apply it to our own hearts and our own lives um, because the book of Revelation, even though it's mysterious, even though it's kind of scary, people uh, avoid it like the plague. I, I, I would, I would like to see some kind of, um, uh, some kind of uh, poll uh, out there. You know, what, what are the top five, uh, uh, or, or what are the top five books of the Bible that people avoid the most? And I would guess somewhere in the top five would be Revelation and the book of Leviticus. Um, and, and possibly the Song of Solomon is in there somewhere, but uh, we we should not be afraid of of these books of the Bible that that are strange to us and that that are just otherworldly to us, because it is God's word and God's word is always always relevant. And to that end, let's talk about how we can make or how we not make God's word re not make. Let me back up. <laughs> let's talk about how uh, we can see the relevance of the Book of Revelation. In our own lives. Well, it begins with looking at the background of the book of Revelation. When John wrote the book of Revelation, the Roman Empire was uh, ruling and reigning supreme uh, in the land, uh, and, and uh, imperial worship or, or worship of the emperor was commonplace. Uh, in, in fact, this, the, uh, the letters to the seven churches, in, in, in each location of these seven churches, there was a temple, there was a temple that was built uh, for uh, the purpose of wor worshiping the, the emperor, worshiping the Roman emperor. Um, and so that was the culture into which John is writing. That's the culture in which uh, John's readers uh, would be living. I mean, um, as a matter of fact, uh, emperor worship infiltrated even uh, the social life, the political life, um, the, the economic life of that day and time uh, in order to, uh, it was quite often uh, to be found that, that in order to join a trade guild, guild or what we would call maybe a union, um, you had to basically uh, give allegiance to imperial worship or worship of the emperor. And Christians couldn't do this. Uh, so Christians were ostracized. They were persecuted for their faith. And this, uh, this is the type of person that John is writing to, uh, a believer in Jesus, um, surrounded by a culture that is very hostile to the things of Jesus, and they're seeking to live out their faith in a hostile culture. I mean, it sounds like First Peter. It sounds like First and Second Peter when we were uh, going through First Peter before Advent. That's the type of person Peter is writing to. Well, John is writing to the exact same uh, uh, type of person. So that's John's audience. The other thing we need to, we need to take note of very quickly is the type of literature that John is writing. It, it's uh, called apocalyptic. Uh, we read it, and it sounds like Lord of the Rings when we read it. You know, it sounds like the, it sounds like Narnia. Um, but John is merely drawing on Old Testament imagery, Old Testament prophetic imagery, um, to speak good news uh, to his readers. And along that front, 
we cannot, we, we should read the book of Revelation just like we read any other book of the Bible. For some odd reason, there are many scholars and, and pastors out there uh, where they, they will change the rules on how to read a biblical book or how to apply a biblical book uh, when it comes to the book of Revelation. And what, what I mean by that is this. When we read the, 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 the Pauline letters of First and Second Corinthians, before we apply it to ourselves, we take, we take into account the situation into which Paul is writing. So we, we have to understand how Paul's readers would have understood 1 Corinthians before we can understand it for our own hearts and minds. We have to see what Paul was saying to them and then take what Paul was saying to them and apply it to us. The same thing applies to the book of Revelation. We have to take into account uh, the, the cultural background of, of John's readers um, we have to take into account the cultural context of John's readers before we can apply it to our, our, our own minds and hearts. Um, and so John is not writing just about 21st century events to a first century audience. Because John is wanting the first century audience, audience to understand what John is saying. And so therefore he's going to appeal to the first century audience with first century things. And chances are John, uh, the, a large part of John's audience is Jewish. And so John is going to read images from the book of Ezekiel. John's going to use uh, images from the book of Isaiah, the book of Jeremiah, the, especially the book of Daniel. And they're going to read those images and go, okay, I, I'm going to take those images and I'm going to apply it to what I'm going through here in the first century. And it's going to make sense to me. And so we have to take it a step further. We have to take those Old Testament images, apply it to the first century in and through the personal work of Jesus Christ, and then bring it into our context, day, and time. And so that's what we're going to do. Um, and so let's jump right into it. We're, we're, we're going to jump right into uh, Revelation chapter 1. And I'm only going to read verses 1 to 7. And give me just three or four minutes to, to, to walk you through verses 1 to 7. Uh, and then we'll go through the rest of chapter 1 uh, this Friday morning. So let's look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the, pro the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. Now, let's, uh, let's take into consideration the cultural context of, of John's readers in the first century. They are under Roman imperial rule. They are surrounded with uh, uh, in, imperial worship, where, where the Roman Empire was worshipped and, and deified. Um, and, and so they were ostracized from the culture. They, they felt like pilgrims in a foreign land. And John is writing to these readers to comfort them, to strengthen them in their faith, to instruct them on, on, on how to live life for, for the sake of Christ um, in their current cultural context. And that sounds like the rest of the New Testament. John is not giving them a different message. John is recapitulating uh, a message that the other gospel writers have already proposed. And that is, look, you have been bought with a price You've been bought by the blood of, your, of, of Jesus Christ, and, you have, you, and he has caused you to become a, a, a newly constituted people of God in a culture that, that, is, that will be completely hostile to the things of God, hostile to the gospel. And so therefore, this is how you are to live your life in the midst of this cultural hostility. And notice how he, notice how he, uh, he, he comes to comfort them. He says, uh, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the, thing, the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So notice the chain of communication. It goes from God to Jesus to angel to John. 
In other words, this message on how to live for the sake of Christ, how to live for the gospel in a hostile culture, comes directly um, from, 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 from God's mouth to Jesus, down to an angel, and down to John himself. In fact, he calls himself a uh, he calls himself a witness. He calls himself some he calls himself someone bearing a testimony. Um, and then look at verse three. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So three things I want you to notice in verse 3. Blessed are the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. This is, this is the only book of the Bible that I can recall um, that, that uh, makes this claim. Now, it's not that the other books of the Bible don't make this claim, but this is the only book of the Bible that makes this claim, that those who read it aloud are blessed. Those who hear it are blessed. Those who keep what is written in it are blessed. What John is doing is he is, he is merely um, reflecting the intention of every book of the Bible. But yet we avoid reading the book of Revelation. We avoid reading the book of Leviticus. We avoid reading the book of Song, the, the, the Song of Solomon because we're scared of it as, a, as opposed to doing the hard study to seek to understand it. Don't we want to be blessed? In fact, the word blessed literally means happy or joyful. Joyful is the one who, who reads it out loud. Joyful is the one who hears it. And joyful is the one who keeps it. Why? Because something is being revealed to us. The, the gospel of Jesus Christ is being revealed to us. In fact, the book of Revelation is the, is the Greek word apocalypsis, which means an unveiling. There's a pulling back of the curtain, if you will. And this is what God is doing through the witness of, of John here to us, to our own hearts and minds, and to these first century readers. God is pulling back the curtain. He's He's, he's revealing something to them so that they may have strength and courage to live for, the, live for their faith in the first century. Well, our, our time's are running out, and so I, I said we would we would jump into verses 4 to 7 this morning. Well, we'll say verses 4 to 7 until Friday morning. We're not in, not in a hurry, but let's focus on the, the, those things in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and who keep it, who keep what is written in it for the time is near. So here's my challenge to you this morning, and, and maybe to my own heart and, and mine, is this. Am I seeking to read God's word out loud? Am I seeking to hear God's word? Am I seeking to keep God's word? Am I seeking to understand how to live out my faith for God's glory and for the good of the world because of what Christ did for me? So brothers and sisters, be, be strengthened uh, in what Christ has done for you. Be strengthened in the fact that God has revealed his will to you in his son, Jesus Christ, right here in his word. And, and seek to read it out loud. Read it out loud to your children. Read it out loud to your spouse. Read it out loud to your, your, your uh, members in your Sunday school class. Read it out loud to your fellow Christians. Hear it and keep it. Because in doing so, you fulfill the law of Christ in yourselves and to the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being so good and gracious toward us. Thank you so much for revealing uh, your will your will to us in your word. Thank you so much for revealing the gospel to us in your word. Father, I pray that, that we seek to read it out loud. I pray that we seek to hear it. I pray that we seek to keep it so that we may know how to live for your son, Jesus Christ, in a hostile culture. And all these things ask your son's precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you haven't read chapter one, I'm going to challenge you to go and read chapter one. We'll, we'll hit verses four uh, to seven uh, this Friday morning. But in the meantime, if, if you're reading the book of Revelation, you have any questions, uh, email me, call me, text me, um, carrier pigeon, whatever, however you want to reach out to me, do so. But in the meantime, know that I'm praying for you and uh, I hope to see you soon. God bless.